Okay, everybody, it is two o'clock. And I wanna get us started on our class today. We're gonna to be going over donor retention and engagement. This is just class number one. There's actually three classes. The second class is a similar format where it's um, a webinar format like this, where our third class is more of a one-on-one -on -one retention strategy session. So you'll be able to schedule time with me, a half hour session to go over your retention plans and Hopefully I can help you spot some opportunities. So without further ado, I'd love to dive into our class today. Again, we will go over your questions throughout the class. Um, so feel free to continue chatting in your questions and we'll either get to them in the middle or we'll also have some time set aside at the end to tackle your questions as well. Um, so feel free to engage as much as you'd like um, and ask as many questions as pop up during our conversation. So a uh, little bit about me. I'm Candace. I've been at Coswax for four and a half, almost five years now, and I'm the manager of success and education here at Coswax. So I will be your speaker for your course today. A little bit about Cosvox before we move forward. Cosvox helps you raise more with less effort through our digital fundraising software. Um, a lot of software out there is really clunky, complex, and contract bound, and a little expensive as well. Um, but Cosvox helps you tidy up your digital fundraising, making it easy for you and your donors um, to run donation pages, crowdfunding, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising in less time and with less hassle. So um, if you're interested in learning more about Cosvox and how we can help you grow your digital fundraising, please feel free to check us out at Cosvox.com and you can always ask me any questions that you have about that as well. So going over our fundraising planning, uh, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, donor retention course, um, we're gonna be going over the intro to donor retention today, that's our class. Um, so we'll be diving into just the donor retention basics and learning a little bit more about how you can set your own donor retention goals. And so going over engagement strategies as well. Uh, class number two is on February 25th at 2 p.m. Eastern, um, where we're gonna be going over top donor retention strategies. So we'll dive into eight plus retention strategies that you can incorporate into your plan. And our third class is gonna be individually scheduled. So that will be um, us, you know, doing that one-on-one -on -one donor retention coaching session. So in, in addition to the course, you're gonna get access to all the slides, recordings of class one and class two. So don't worry about having to catch everything that we go over today. You will have the recordings. We'll send out the recording tomorrow for today's class and you'll also get the access to those slides. Um, and then you'll also receive the one-on-one -on -one consultation. We also have some templates and resources for you. So one of which is a donor retention calculator. So you'll get that today um, and also in our follow-up emails as well as the donor retention and engagement playbook. So we have a whole ebook. It's like 75 pages of content. Um, so it's really super detailed. You're gonna get that downloadable PDF. Um, we also have a smart goals worksheet, which um, directly ties into um, creating those goals for your retention strategies. Um, and we also have a template for you um, for a nurturing, for creating a nurturing journey, which we'll get into a little bit more in just a bit. So um, yeah, let's dive right into our course material for today. Um, we're going to be going over three basic things during our class. So that's going to be the donor retention basics. So just going over what donor retention is, kind of what the standard is, and how you can find out what your donor retention rates are. Um, and then number two, we're going to be taking a look at donor retention and digital fundraising because they really play off of each other. And there's um, a really practical way for you to be able to measure and engage donor retention with digital. And um, number three, we're gonna be looking at donor nurturing and engagement. So just going over some basic strategies that you'll wanna think through. So without further ado, let's dive into 
just looking at donor retention from a high level. So donor retention is such an important strategy for your organization. And we're gonna dive into a little bit more about why. Um, so on average, nonprofit organizations lose about 55% of their donors each year. So that means that more than half of your donors that gave last year are probably not going to give this year. So that sounds like a really scary statistic, um, but it's something that you actually have a lot of power and control over. Um, and then something else that jumps out at why donor retention is so important for your organization is that it actually costs five times more to attract new donors than it does to acquire a gift from returning donors. So your return on investment and return on effort is gonna get um, be way higher with existing donors in your network, which is also what makes it such an important strategy for both growing your fundraising as well as um, making your fundraising more effective overall and, and increasing your return on investment and return on effort. So the time that you put into, you know, acquiring these new donors, you don't have to put quite as much time into retention. Um, although you do have to put quite a bit into nurturing. Um, let's go into a few um, details just about what donor retention is and what some of the terms you're going to be hearing throughout our classes. Um, so donor retention is the percent of donors that return to give another gift in a specific time period. Um, donor retention typically is measured year over year. Um, so how many donors gave last year versus how many donors gave this year. Um, Similarly, donor attrition is the percent of donors that, that your organization loses in a specific time period. So that's gonna be the, the percent um, that's the opposite of your donor retention is your donor attrition. Gift retention refers to the amount donated by returning donors from one year to the next. So gift retention is a little different than donor retention where um, you know, whatever that gift is coming from that same donor, um, is that gift of a similar amount or what amount does that look like? And so we'll be getting a little bit more into gift retention later as well. Um, and something that all of this culminates into, so um, donor retention and gift retention play a huge role in donor lifetime value. And this is really something that you'll want to look into at your organization when you take a look at analyzing your donor retention and gift retention rates. So donor lifetime value is how much the average donor gives from their first to their last donation. So um, yeah, donor retention and gift retention play a big role in this. Um, and it's really super important to get to know your donor lifetime value and have incorporate that into your goals for retention. To lay a little bit of the land at what retention looks like today. Um, so the average donor retention rate is 45%. The average gift retention rate is 48%, which is actually a good thing. So um, this tells us that donors that give again are giving more so that that there's that 3% increase. So if you are able to retain those donors, they're going to give more the next time and you can increase that donor lifetime value. So there is some bad news that I have to share. So on average, 23% of first time donors give again. So that's a bit of a scary number because you're putting so much time and so much effort into getting these new donors through the door. Um, you've probably largely focused on acquiring new donors with every different initiative that you're doing. Um, of course, you're targeting current donors as well, but a huge part is um, part of your plan is likely you know, acquiring those new donors. So once you do acquire those new donors, only 23% of them on average stay. And so that's a little scary. However, um, oh, and then something else where once that donor leaves, they're 
unfortunately probably not coming back. So this isn't necessarily just for first time donors, this could be for any donor, but the likelihood of a lapsed donor, so a donor who hasn't given in two or more years, will give again is only 2.2%. So that's from a study from Bloomerang um, that Bloomerang did a couple years ago. And so unfortunately, when you lose your donors, you're probably losing them for good. Um, however, there's a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel here where 63% of repeat donors are retained. So what it really boils down to is that you can implement strategies to help retain your donors so you can turn this 23% rate into that 63% or more, hopefully, donor retention rate for your organization. So um, we'll be going into really diving into these strategies mostly during our, our next class. And I'll go through um, data-driven tips based on um, retention rates. But also a uh, great light at the end of the tunnel is that a 10% increase in donor retention can yield a 200% increase in projected value. So um, Adrian Sardant, he's a um, specialist when it comes to retention and donor loyalty. So he projected a 200% increase in value in your donors that you're able to keep. So uh, when, you, when you have a 10% increase in donor retention. So really what this boils down to is that donor retention is such a huge opportunity for your nonprofit or, um, to really grow your fundraising and grow it sustainably. Because when you invest in your donors and investing and in increasing that donor retention rate, that lays the foundation for you to really increase your fundraising in um, a significant way. So some of the benefits of donor retention and, and focusing on donor retention as part of your strategy is that you're going to see increased funds raised year over year. So with more retention, um, when you acquire those new donors, you're going to see um, a real dramatic increase in what you're bringing in year over year um, when you increase that retention rate at your organization. Um, you're also going to see increased lifetime value. So what this really looks like is your donors are going to stay for longer and they're going to give more over the course of their time with you. Um, this also means that it's going to cost you less time, less effort, and less money on acquiring new donors. So um, you can, when you're focusing on donor retention, um, you don't have to quite invest quite as much. So that goes back to that. It's five times less expensive to keep donors than it is to bring in new ones. Um, and I think that also really ties into how much time that you as a fundraiser are putting into um, acquiring new donors as well. Um, similarly, the benefits of donor retention is that it actually allows you to build really deep relationships with your donors. Um, that go just beyond the dollars raised from them. And I think this is really important to the rest of our conversation is that, you know, keeping donors is so much about your relationship with them. And when you keep a donor, they're able to grow with you over time and really become um, not just monetarily invested in your organization, but emotionally invested in your organization and want to continue partnering with you with maybe even unseen ways, um, like you know, becoming peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers and the like for you afterwards. So there's so many benefits of donor retention that you can really get out of when you make it a key focus of your fundraising strategy. So let's get into talking uh, a little bit more about calculating your donor retention rates. So this is something that you'll want to do after class today is really take a look at your numbers at your organization. So um, to calculate your donor retention rate, you're going to take a look at your donors, your total number of donors in 2018 versus your total number of donors in 2019. And what you want to do is see how many of those donors returned in 2019 
and divide the number of returning donors by the total number of donors from the previous year. Um, so for example, if 100 donors from last year returned to give gifts, again, out of 250 total donors the year before, you retained 40% of your donors and lost 60%, uh, so that's your donor attrition rate. Um, so this is a, it's a pretty simple calculation. Um, and there's a few ways that beyond just getting that total year over year idea of um, donor retention, there's actually a lot of deeper insights that you can pull from um, getting a little more granular about your donor retention rates that I think will give you a lot of insights into um, how your donors like to give and what their activities really um, like where they really flourish with engagement. So I think you can pull a lot of really interesting insights from this. So one of the things that you can do is examine retention quarterly. Um, so if this is something that you want to grow in um, with not just expecting donors to give once a year, um, but really hoping that they come back and are, are consistently giving and involved with your organization, I think it's really interesting to see what that retention looks like quarterly. So um, you may want to incorporate that into your analysis when you're looking at your donor retention rates. There's also um, a really interesting way to do it is you can also examine retention based on particular fundraising activities. So you probably have, uh, like a lot of organizations do, an event in the spring, maybe an event in the fall, you have your annual fundraising. So maybe break out these particular fundraising activities and just see like who gave to what over the course of the um, year and see how many donors were retained with each of your fundraising activities. Because um, you may find some particular insights with, you know, maybe one activity is more effective for retaining donors and getting another gift from them. Um, another thing that we'll dive a really closely into this later, but I think it's important to break down donor retention into segments. Um, and one of these segments that I would highly suggest focusing on is similar to how we just went over all of those statistics between first time donor retention, repeat donor retention, recurring donor retention, retention um, which we'll also get into later. Um, I would suggest breaking it down into those, those types of donors just to gain what insights and also see how you measure up to those um, averages. And so I think there's a lot of information that you can draw out of that to help you better set um, retention goals and spot particular areas for improvement. So an action item for you following our class today is to calculate your donor retention rate. Um, and I, I would again really highly suggest breaking this out into the types of donors um, and how many uh, times they have given. And then also identify some focus areas based on that analysis of your donor retention rates. Um, and with those focus areas that you draw out, try and set some retention goals. So we have some resources to help you do this. So um, you are going to get in that email that goes out tomorrow, um, access to this donor retention calculator to help you really simply and easily do this and keep track of it. Um, you'll be able to download this and can use that in Excel. Um, <clears throat> and just, Going forward, so what you're actually getting out of this course is that you're gonna get that donor retention analysis that comes from looking at your donor retention metrics. You're also going to get a fully completed retention goals worksheet um, to help you implement your retention goals and strategies. And lastly, you're also going to get that one-on-one -on -one coaching session with me. So I'm, I'll go over your plan with you, I'll go over your goals and um, take a look at your donor retention rates and maybe help you spot some opportunities um, that maybe you haven't seen or just um, also answer any remaining questions that you have after the course as well. So your templates that you're getting, donor, so I just went over the calculator. Um, this is 
uh, the fundraising goals worksheet that you're gonna get. Um, so if you participated in our last class, um, we went over this really, really super in depth, but basically this framework works really well for mapping out your donor retention focus areas and strategies. So what you'll end up doing is kind of breaking it out into those different segments that you wanna see improvement in donor retention with. And just as clearly and um, specifically as possible, setting very, um, very specific goals for each kind of focus area. So let's say you're, um, for example, focusing on um, thank you, follow-up emails and phone calls. So if that's a focus area for you, um, you might want to have a specific um, percent increase that you're looking for um, for first-time donors. So just breaking it out in as a specific way as possible into what exactly you're doing and what you hope to get out of each of your retention strategies. So we'll go over this more um, as well later on. So something else we'll be referring to is a nurturing journey. Um, this will come about a little bit later. We'll get into what this can look like for you, but we'll give you access to this template as well um, to help you build out your own nurturing journey if you don't already have one. So, uh, we can also, at the end of this class, I'll paste the links in the chat, but um, we'll send all of these links out in our email tomorrow. All right, so now that we've gone over some of the basics of donor retention, we're going to take a real close look at how this interacts with digital fundraising. And so as we get into this, I think it's really important to understand what actually motivates a donor to give to your organization. Because this, I, I believe, directly plays into how you nurture and grow your relationship with your donors. Um, and so this is from a donor loyalty study. Um, so 59% said um, that the donors were passionate about the cause. 45% know that the organization depends on them. That's why they keep giving. 33% um, know someone affected by the cause. Um, and so you'll see with really all of these statistics here is that the real heart of it is donors feel personally connected with the cause. Um, and so they feel personally connected with the cause and they also feel personally connected with the organization because they know that the organization depends on their, them for their donation. So I think this really plays into how personal it really is for one of your donors to make a donation. Um, and these motivations are really important to keep in mind when you think about retaining donors. So um, on the contrary, why do donors leave? This is also super important in understanding what retention strategies actually work to help retain donors. Um, and so the vast majority of donors leave because of a lack of communication. So 5% um, thought that the nonprofit didn't need them anymore. So if 45% people, 45% of people give because they know that the organization depends on them, but then all of a sudden they kind of feel like they don't receive any communication um, really assuring them that their gift was needed. Um, that plays a huge role in sort of what, um, what makes a donor stay. Um, a lot of this also, you know, never got thanked for donating. Um, they have no memory of supporting, so they must not have received many, if any, communications from them. Um, some of it, it has to do with impact reporting. They don't know how their donation was spent or really made an impact. Um, others more deserving. This also goes into kind of not really capturing the minds and the hearts of donors. Um, poor service is, is uh, that's a hard one too, because that has a lot to do with 
um, probably how they gave, um, maybe not having the, the products in place that make it easy for people to give. So if it was difficult to make a donation or um, maybe they also didn't quite feel um, that the organization cared about them, um, you know, that plays a lot into it. And I would even argue here so that 54% could no longer afford. Um, I think that has a lot more to do with um, kind of not being told how their organization made an impact, um, even with smaller donations. Um, so, you know, sometimes donors feel like even if they can't give as much as they gave before, um, that their donation doesn't really count. Um, so I think that's also something too, where kind of celebrating all levels of donors and, and trying to tie that to impact can also um, make donors feel important enough that um, whatever it is that they can afford actually um, translates to making an impact. So these are all great insights. You probably wanna come back to them later. Um, but I think both of these things really tie into the, the core question that we're gonna try and get out is that what, are, what do donors want? So when someone gives um, and when, when a donor gives and when a donor leaves, what is it that they're hoping for and expecting and deserve when they're making a donation to an organization? So I think this really uniquely and specifically ties into digital fundraising um, so I think a lot of this can be explored through trends, um, donation trends, donor trends. Um, so I'll get into some of these trends now. So within the last two years, there has been a 24% growth in online donations. So increasingly donors are turning um, to digital to contribute to the organizations that um, they want to give to. And in 2018, mobile giving increased by 205%. So that shows a huge shift to mobile, which I think has a lot to do with donor convenience. So it seems like that's playing into donors wanting to give, uh, how donors want to give. We've also seen a 65 on our end um, with all of our fundraising website traffic. So whether it's to donation pages or crowdfunding campaigns or peer to peer, whatever it is, um, all of 65% and growing um, of all website traffic is mobile and is growing constantly. So also showing that big shift and increasing shift to mobile. Um, also, 54% of consumers have used a mobile wallet to make a payment. So this also goes into how donors want to be giving. Um, it doesn't just include credit cards. It's also incorporating Apple Pay and Google Pay, where this is also a growing trend and it also makes it easier for the donor. So I think this plays into a lot of the ease of use that donors are expecting and hoping for. Um, and also recurring giving grew 17% last year. So this is a really intriguing insight because it really shows a broader shift towards donors wanting to be consistently engaged with your organization. And this is really, really good news for you as you look at donor retention. Um, and then 68% of donors agree that knowing how their donation makes an impact is important to their gift. So this also goes back to what do donors want? They wanna know that they're making an impact, you know? Um, you, they want to feel the, the good feelings and then they wanna feel seen and appreciated by your organization. And of course, they also want to um, be assured that when they do give, it matters. Um, so this really goes into that nurturing and engagement that your organization does. So all of these insights really end up telling us that donors want an easy giving experience, whether it's mobile, desktop, but mostly um, increasingly towards mobile now. Um, they want it to be easy to make a donation. They are expecting frequent communication from you um, and hoping for a deep relationship to develop with your organization. So even today, like we're constantly connected. I'm you know, different social media. I am on my Instagram, on my phone, I'm on Facebook. I get emails, I get 
um, all these different communications coming from everywhere in your organization um, can and should be doing the same because this is how online relationships are really developed and um, donors can feel a deep, deeper connection with your organization the more that you communicate and the better that you communicate with them. So let's take a look at um, the current state of fundraising and how this is kind of in juxtaposition to um, what donors are really wanting. So um, today there's a lot of this like stop start project style fundraising. So a lot of the organizations that I work with, um, you know, they maybe do, they do fundraising two to three times a year. So they're focused on getting um, maybe new donors to an event in the spring and then they're doing an annual fundraiser um, in the fall to winter. Um, so I think this idea that many organizations get stuck in um, is that like fundraising begins and ends somewhere um, and it kind of has this longer cycle um, than what many donors today are, are sort of expecting and hoping for. Um, this also leads to, to those longer cycles. It makes it harder to retain them over time. Um, and it makes it harder to repeat and consistently grow. Um, so really all of this um, boils down to that digital fundraising is really super important to your fundraising plan because it's not just the future of fundraising, it's now. Um, and it's how increasingly more and more donors are giving and expect to be able to give and interact with your your organization is on digital. Um, so we've actually seen um, some, some strategies come out of digital fundraising um, that help you consistently and sustainably grow your fundraising. So um, how we see digital fundraising is that it's a process oriented approach that aligns with your donors needs and expectations. Um, and it's designed to help you sustainably grow your fundraising where you're not doing the stops to start cycles, um, but really incorporating digital fundraising into your every day um, so that you can have very predictable and sustainable growth. So this um, really comes down to um, what we've found to be the digital fundraising cycle. So we created this. Um, where you attract your donors um, through uh, focusing on SEO strategies, social media, digital ads. And then once you get those donors through the door, you want to do your best to nurture them. So um, donors don't just, um, it, it takes a little bit to develop that relationships where they're familiar enough with their organization that they can convert and uh, become a donor and then consistently, um, you're gonna wanna con continue this cycle where this is a repeatable process. So even after a donor converts, you're gonna be continuing, continually nurturing them um, so that they are retained for, for the next time. So um, we'll break this down a little bit further. So when you're trying to attract donors to your organization that are really designed to um, to be retained. These are some of the few strategies that we suggest. So um, going into search engine optimization. Um, so making sure that the donors that are interested in your cause are able to find you. Um, so this has also a lot to do with content generation. So, um, you know, when people are Googling um, your cause, your organization, make sure that they can find you. So that's a huge part in um, attracting donors that are really driven by um, your a connection to your cause. Um, similarly with so social media, being able to engage audiences online. Um, and I think that leads a lot to storytelling, which we'll get into in a bit. Um, there's also some paid media. So um, Google ads are a great way to increase your nonprofit's visibility. There's also a Google ad grant where your organization can receive up to $10,000 a month to um, really boost uh, your visibility, um, especially in search. 
So that's something that you'll want to look into and I can provide some additional resources if you're interested. So feel free to reach out to me. Um, we have some webinars on that, um, free, web free webinars. Um, and there's also Facebook and social media ads. So um, looking into advertising with um, your current audience, as well as looking at um, lookalike audiences, which are um, organizations that are similar to yours and targeting those people that um, are interested in following similar organizations because they're likely going to be interested in your cause as well. Um, so we won't get too, too much into the attract side of things, but this is more about attracting donors that are designed to be retained. Um, we'll get into a lot of nurturing. So um, basically when you're trying to, again, attract a donor that's um, designed to be retained, there's a couple ways that you're going to be doing this. So um, some of that is with just educating them um, on the cause itself, getting them uh, to have a knowledge of the cause and your organization. Um, and there's also a storytelling component, so you're capturing their hearts. Um, we'll get into more of that later. Um, and then there's also getting donor insights um, and having actionable donor insights. Um, so learning what is important to the, your prospective donors and being able to kind of target that um, in whichever way that you do. And um, we also highly suggest when you're nurturing donors, um, mixing it up um, through multi-channel communications. So we'll get more into that later. And then as far as it goes to actually converting these donors, um, these prospective donors into donors, um, a few strategies we recommend is just having that mobile optimization and payments in place. So you're meeting your donors where their, their needs are and where they're expecting to be able to give. Um, and just being present on, with online giving, even if you're doing offline events. Um, so donors, you know, can still give on their phone, for example, um, it, at an in-person event and having that online and offline engagement. Um, cause that's going to be meeting your donors where they are. Um, also peer to peer fundraising. So this is, um, a really interesting way to not just convert a donor, but also once that donor is converted to continually engage them. So having them fundraise on your behalf and then also, uh, converting one time or returning donors to recurring giving, which we'll get into, uh, more during the next class. Um, just a quick note on peer to peer, um, is that organizations that use peer to peer fundraising tend to raise about twice as much as compared with other online fundraising campaigns. So when it goes, when it comes to finding a strategy to not just retain a donor, but also, um, get them to go back through the cycle and attract more donors for you, peer to peer is massively successful in doing this. Um, so, um, we'll get into a little bit more of that next time, but just a quick note on peer to peer as it can help, um, you continually drive donations and, and attract more donors to your organization. So, um, yeah, this process is repeatable. So when you convert a donor really where retention lies is in measuring and repeating this process and continually, um, even with your retention goals, like, um, retention can always be improved unless you're, uh, retaining a hundred percent of donors year over year or month, um, or quarter over quarter. There's so many more improvements that you can make to your process, whether you want, want to better nurture your donors or better convert your donors. There's a lot of opportunities there for you to continually repeat this process so that you're optimizing your fundraising, um, yeah, yeah, you're just like optimizing your fundraising continually um, so that you're better retaining your donors. And so honestly, at the end of the day, um, however your donors come in, whether it's online, offline, um, really donations are a form of commitment. So it's a, it's a commitment from your donor who is now investing in your organization. They're, they're putting their money where their mouth is. They want to be part of what it is that you're doing 
And similarly, um, it goes it goes the other way too, where you as an organization need to be committed to your donors, where you're invested in them as well, and that really drives retention. Um, and so a lot of that is being invested in what your donors want and your, your donors need. Um, so uh, one thing that you can do is develop a nurturing journey. Um, so this is an example um, we can even dive further into later um, about how to develop this. But basically when a new donor comes in as a standard best practice, you're going to want to have a series of communications going out to them to best steward that donor and help them become really familiar with your organization and invested in your organization in a new way. So giving them new information or more information about your cause, what your organization is doing and how their donation is making an impact is really going to do a lot, go a long way um, to not just educating them and making them feel happy feelings, but those happy feelings also translate into more conversions later on. And so um, what you want to do next is kind of map out what you're currently doing to attract, nurture, and convert donors. I think this, the nurture and convert um, phases are, are more significant here, where, um, you know, do you have a nurturing journey when, when a new donor arrives? Do you have a plan in place um, for new donors. Um, and then when you do want to convert those donors again, what does that look like and does that match up to their expectations? So I would just kind of take a look at what you currently do to engage in, and um, convert donors and consider where the gaps are in those nurturing and conversion stages. So um, without further ado, we're going to get more into some of the nurturing strategies um, that are really highly effective for engaging your donors. Um, so donor retention and donor communication are intricately linked. Um, donors are retained through relationships. So um, what you want to do at your organization is make sure that you're communicating really, really effectively with your donors. Um, and there's a couple ways for you to do that. So I touched on this earlier where um, there's two basic kinds of content that drive engagement and you need both of them in order to be really successful with engaging both the hearts and minds of your donors. Um, so there's the more educational side. So you're answering the question, what it is you do uh, and what is really the, the cause that's at stake. So you want to inform them through statistics about, um, about your cause. You also want to inform them through statistics about the impact of your organization, as well as you know, going into more details about what your programs entail, um, your return on investment, so showing that you're um, good stewards of um, their funds. So this kind of attracts the, the head of the donor. Um, and then there's also more story-driven content, which answers really why you do what you do, why the donor should care, and, um, and really like why what you do is so important. And this looks like more engaging content through like video storytelling. Um, also just even really strong images are, are really important and really effective. Um, as like a best practice, if you're going to be sharing an image on social media, for example, um, you'll want to try and focus actually on like only one or two people in a photo, um, just because that helps people, uh, associate more with the image itself and, and get an understanding of who it is that your organization is impacting, um, cause people give to people uh at the end of the day and then um also this looks like a lot of written content on your beneficiaries and staff so writing out their stories whether it's the the people or um, things that you're improving um having those stories written out um or also great idea is to kind of um pull from staff members who are working in the field and 
write their stories as well. Um, this could also even go as far as um, sharing stories of donors and board members about why they're so invested in your organization as well. Um, also something that I think is really, really powerful is when you share di direct quotes from the people who are benefiting from your organization, um, just because uh, it just removes uh, a whole layer <laughs> um, for the, the donor because they, they, they can hear in the beneficiary's own words as why, why their donation is so important, how that really affects them personally. Um, so this came from one of our customers, uh, Nick Hudson at Stupid Cancer. He said the best and most effective promotional tactics we use are posts that involve patient stories that come from the patients themselves. Um, they're telling their story in their own words with quotes directly from them. And then we can say, hey, here's how our organization can help them. So I wanted to share a really good example of this. Um, so I, I was browsing on their Facebook and I came across this video um, and it was from a patient who was about to go to uh, into chemo again. And um, she asked her dad to shave her head before she went in. Um, and it's just such a personal moment. And she, she took a video of it um, and she shared her own story. And so what I think is so powerful about this, I'm actually getting serious here and like talk about it, is that because it really puts the donor in the place of, um, in, in the place of the, the people that you're benefiting, it, it helps them understand really the impact in the day to day and empathize with your beneficiaries. And then when your organization can come alongside that and say, hey, we need your help in order to help this person that you're watching this video of or listening to this story or quote of, um, it just becomes a whole other level of um, power that you really have at your organization to, um, to really engage your donors and help them see impact and not just hear a statistic about it. Um, so yeah, so one thing you can take away from the stupid cancer example is that um, really powerful storytelling drives uh, donor engagement. Um, also kind of looking into multimedia content and getting creative about how you pull these stories. Um, you know, whether trying to get some videos if possible, I think is always really, really good. Um, but also strong images and, and really anything that you can pull from. Um, and also personal stories. So people give to people um, and, you know, kind of keeping that in mind um, where you want to focus on one person that someone can really empathize with and connect with and feel like they want to help this particular person and that's why they're giving. Um, when that is connected, that's where you get um, those repeat donations a lot of the times. Um, okay, so an action item for you to help you best um, nurture your donors is to create a story bank. So this is gonna be um, educational and story-driven content um, from you know, your board members, your donors, your beneficiaries, your, um, your staff. Just do whatever you can to create a big list of these stories because that's gonna come in time and time again throughout all of your different fundraising initiatives. You can create, um, you can you know, just pull from that big list of stories, pull from that um, you know, maybe beneficiary generated content um, and have that to continually share and engage your donors with. Um, it's gonna really equip you to do that well. Um, now that we're talking about donor um, engagement and nurturing, um, let's talk about how many times it really takes for a donor to decide to make another donation. So um, this is from a bunch of different sources, but experts say that it takes in between seven to 12 touches for a donor to make another donation. So this goes into how frequently you should be communicating with donors. Um, I think some organizations sometimes feel like 
they don't want to bother their donors too much. Um, but really in today's hyper-connected uh, society and we're engaged on so many different platforms, you're going to want to really um, get as many touches with your donors as possible. And so, you know, with that story bank that you created, you know, getting that to them, you know, between seven and 12 times and getting these stories um, to be surrounded by them through different um, uh, ways of communication is going to be really important as well. Um, so this goes right into multi-channel marketing. Um, so this is just really a standard best practice. You, you're probably familiar with it and you're probably already doing it in several ways, but um, whatever it is that you're trying to push at the moment, so whether you're just trying to get donations on your donation page or you're just, um, you know, maybe you're running a specific fundraising initiative, um, having that surround the donor. Um, so on your website, that's highlighted um, on the homepage, for example, like let, so let's say you're doing a fundraising campaign. Um, you're looking to raise $30,000 in the next 30 days. This kind of approach is going to help you do that and get those seven to 12 touches as quickly and effectively as possible. So just having um, that featured on your website, featured in your emails, um, on social media, direct mail, really like having this surround the donor in all of the ways that they're currently used to communicating. Um, and this also ties directly in with your nurturing journey. So when someone first comes into your organization as a best practice, you don't want to just email them because not everyone's an email person. Emails can be really effective, but maybe that's not how your particular donor spends their time. So as a best practice, you want to try and communicate in as many different ways as possible with this donor. Um, so whether that's email, social media, um, uh, uh, mass texting, SMS um, messages right to their phone, maybe you want to give them a call. Um, think through all of the different kinds of channels you want to use when it comes to developing your nurturing journey because that's going to help you um, get those 7 to 12 uh, touches in as quick and as uh, seamless a way as possible, really. Um, and so when you're creating your own nurturing journey, um, there's a few best practices that I would highly recommend um, to make your life easier and also make your, um, your nurturing journey most effective. Um, so the first thing is try to automate everything. Um, you don't want to have to be worried about every time a new donor comes in, now you have to manually enroll them in something. Um, there are so many services that can help you do this. So you're probably using a lot of them already. MailChimp, Constant Contact are great examples. Um, other organizations have used Emma, My Emma. Um, it's kind of an interesting one. Um, ConvertKit, there's so many ways that you can automate at the very least the email portion of your outreach, but you may be able to also integrate um, some of that texting and other options and automate that as well. Um, and that's actually something you're able to do uh, through Causebox um, and our integrations with these different kinds of software. So for example, a donor comes in on Causebox, they automatically get a donation receipt, and then you can um, have them auto enrolled through whatever email service you're using um, into a campaign that goes out um, to, to educate that donor and engage them. Um, Multi-channel, we went over that, kind of surrounding your donors with communication um, in all of the ways that they're, they're um, expecting and used to being communicated with. Um, also, best practices, have a short timeline. Um, so your nurturing journey shouldn't take longer than a month um, because uh, if it's anything longer than that, they, you run the risk of them not fully um, understanding what it is that they actually just gave to. You run the risk of maybe not being able to impact, uh, show them impact quickly enough. Um, so having that short timeline to get them fully educated through, uh, through all of these different messages that you're sending um, is actually going to help them feel more closely connected with your organization quickly 
and develop that deeper relationship so you, you have that foundation to work off of moving forward and getting that you know second and uh, third and fourth gift. Um, also, uh, standard best practices to segment um, and personalize the experience for your donors as well. Um, we'll get into that in just a bit. Um, I think I'm running a little behind, so we may run like five minutes over. Um, if, you, if you have to go, feel free. Um, but we'll also be, you know, sending out these recordings, so you're, you won't miss anything. Um, okay, so uh, content tips. So the types of content that you should include in your nurturing journeys um, as a standard best practice um, is having like a welcome from the executive director. I think it always um, feels important that um, someone higher up at the organization, even if it's um, even if they kind of know that it's coming from an automation, I think just having that personal touch from the ED goes a long way to making them feel recognized and special. Um, also, I would suggest incorporating a donor survey into your nurturing journey at one point so you can learn more about your donor. Um, Story-based driven content. Um, another thing that is really interesting is trying to highlight your different programs because um, you never know uh, what programs a donor is really going to resonate with. Um, they may feel more personally connected with one of them. Um, so having some program specific content is really interesting and also helps them get to know like the full uh, breadth that your organization, um, like everything that your organization really does. Um, upcoming events. So that's a great opportunity for people to engage with you. So the events don't always have to be in person. Um, I think even uh, like either like Facebook live events um, or just any kind of um, interaction opportunity um, for them is, is really interesting. So uh, maybe incorporating both on and offline events um, and ways for them to connect with you further. Um, also how to get further involved, you know, this is likely going to be like um, become a peer to peer fundraiser or um, volunteer or, um, you know, any other ways that they can, you know, follow you on social media, for example, if they haven't done so already. Um, so also great uh, thing to put in your nurturing journey. Um, and then also uh, something you really want to do, no matter what email it is, is have a strong call to action um, and purpose for each email. So, um, you know, your call to action from like the welcome email, for example, maybe to um, visit your homepage to learn more about your organization or visit a uh, testimonials page from people who have benefited from your organization. So uh, I think strong call to actions are really important, but um, for each, each uh, communication, but uh, at the end of your journey, the real call to action at the end is, should be to asking, um, asking them to give, um, cause that's really going to get you that second donation, which is super, super important for your donor retention. Okay. So we talked a lot about nurturing journeys. Um, and so your action item next is to create your own. Um, so I'll send out that template. You can take a look at that and also start building out your own, um, based on that, but, you know, feel free to really tailor it to your organization, your specific needs, um, uh, and your specific needs. So, um, okay. So let's move on from the nurturing journeys a little bit, or shall I say, let's get more into the, into the weeds. Um, so 71% of donors feel more engaged when a nonprofit sends personalized content. Um, and so this goes into um, a little bit more about like why they gave and trying to, to personalize either that nurturing journey or any other communications around um, their preferences. Um, and one way you can really do that is through donor surveys. Um, so in your, in your nurturing journey, you'll probably want to create a, a donor survey for them to fill out just because it gives you so much great information about um, your donors and their motivations, so then you can better tailor your content 
and have more engaging content that specifically interests them. So um, a few recommended questions would just be, why did you donate? Um, really gives them the, the option to share a little bit more about their personal connection, which kind of goes back to, um, you know, earlier when, when um, we talked about like their motivations for giving and trying to meet that. Um, so why did you donate is super, super important to ask. Um, what's this, what specific programs interest you? Um, so that way you can, you know, tailor that program specific content to them, maybe enroll them in a program specific nurturing journey. Um, you know, and also asking about how much of an impact do you feel your gift has? Um, because that's a huge driver for retaining donors um, is, is helping them feel like their donation is important. Um, from one to 10, how would you rate your donation experience? So your donor's experience on whatever device uh, they want to give, it's really, really important because when you invest in your donor's experience, um, they feel like their, um, their experience actually um, like matters to your organization. Like you care about how easy it is for them to give. So I think this is a really interesting point to draw from. Um, birthday and demographics, that's pretty straightforward. You can kind of reach out um, on their birthday, have more of that personalized touch, um, gain more insights into who your donors are. Um, and then preferred contact methods. So maybe um, your donor really prefers email, maybe a donor wants to be called, you know, older donors um, tend to, to like that um, more personalized, like calling um, options, but really kind of see like the ways that they want to be contacted and that can give them a more personalized experience. Um, a really interesting insight is that um, donors that give more than $250 have a 76% retention rate as opposed to the average 45%. So that is a huge indicator that um, of probably where you wanna be investing some of your time when it comes to um, getting a donor, a larger donor, um, especially if it's like a new larger donor, someone that gives $250, like you're gonna even wanna dive more into what motivated that gift so that you can better um, target communications with them. Um, and so uh, that also speaks to um, kind of a need for you to really effectively segment your donors. Um, so there's quite a few ways you can do it. Um, one is the size of the gift, um, which I think is important to do. Um, also the donor type. So this directly ties into your, um, your fundraising, your donation retention goals. Um, so when you use that calculator to get your first time returning recurring donor um, retention rates, and then you do assign specific um, goals for, for each of them, um, donor segmentation really comes into play with that in, in translating to your communications with each of those kinds of donors. Um, so you should have a plan in place for different kinds of communications you plan to send to each type of donor. Um, giving frequency that also ties into retention and, and how often that they're, they're giving to your organization. And maybe you want to set some goals for that and segment donors based on their giving frequency. Um, also, uh, just like, I mean, levels of engagement, their role with their organization, there's a real lot that in their interests. So the more specific you can get to your donors, uh, just like and personalize that content for each type of donor um they're gonna feel more engaged and that's what's gonna really be super important to developing a deep relationship with your donors that helps them um, ultimately be retained uh for donors who are 250 dollars and above this is just like a quick um suggestion so I would um, really dive more into what their philanthropic in interests are, um, like what motivated them to give, um, why they gave to your organization, if they have any kind of long-term goals or interests. Um, and then also kind of looking into like other ways that they might be interested in giving back, whether they wanna be maybe a sponsor for an event or um, volunteering, matching gifts, that kind of thing. Um, also fundraising for you. Um, information about just, just getting to know them honestly more. 
Um, usually I would recommend uh, if a, a new donor comes in that's $250 and above or even existing donors that are $250 and above, just, just give them a call sometimes, uh, you know, just kind of personally reach out, pay a little bit more attention to them. Um, and that's really going to go a long way. Um, and okay. So, uh, action item for you is to look into a way to create your donor surveys. Um, I'll have some suggestions for you. Um, if you're interested in hearing them, there's also, you can find a lot of different survey options online. Um, so I would think through which questions are most important for your organization and incorporate that into creating your donor survey so you can incorporate that into your nurturing journey. And then um, also consider the ways that you want to segment donor communications because you're probably not going to be able to do all of them. That would be a lot of work. Um, but maybe kind of focusing on um, a few of these different donor segmentation methods just so um, you can better um, engage your donors. Um, so uh, we're five minutes over, uh, like I thought. Um, if you're interested in just learning more about how Cosbox can help you retain and engage your um, donors well um, and continually convert them, um, feel free to reach out. I'd love to chat more about what that would look like for your organization. Um, so this was today's class. We went over donor retention basics, um, the calculator, and setting some goals um, for retention. Uh, we also looked at donor retention and having that digital fundraising process in place so that you're better aimed to uh, meet your donors' needs and expectations um, and ultimately retain them. And then we also went over um, basically donor nurturing do journeys and, and engagement methods um, that are highly effective. Um, so next class is the 25th. Uh, we're going to be going over the most effective donor retention strategies. So really, really getting into the nitty gritty of easy wins for your organization when it comes to donor retention that can help you meet those donor retention goals that hopefully you'll be setting after today. Um, also finalizing what some of those goals might look like for, for your organization and crafting your actionable retention plan. Um, so this is all what we're doing on Tuesday. Um, and then after Tuesday, you'll have the opportunity to schedule that one-on-one -on -one, um, retention coaching session with me. Um, so feel free to reach out. Um, and then uh, if anyone has any questions, I didn't see too many questions come in during our conversation, but um, since we're over, I won't, um, I won't spend too much time doing this, but if you have any questions, also feel free to reach out to me um, directly. Um, I'll, I'll paste my um, email, candice at causebox.com if you don't have my email already. Um, I'll also be sending out an email tomorrow to you. So please feel free to continue asking questions, um, any questions that you have about retention. And that's pretty much it guys. So thanks for sticking with me um, through the end of our class today. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all on Tuesday. All right, take care everybody.